it's time to talk type. And first of all, I would like to thank our sponsors, Google Fonts, Mooniac, Sense Imagery, Magic Monkey Salon, and Context. Now I know you are not here to listen to me speak, and also we have got to wrap this up by nine. So let me quickly go through the discussion <laughs> introductions for our five panelists. First of all, we have Professor Jerry Leonidas. Jerry teaches typography and typeface design in the Department of Typography and Graphic Communication at the University of Reading, England. He is the president of International Typographic Association, ATYPI, and he is a co-founder of ISTVZ and Grantian Foundation. He's got decades of experience in the field <laughs> and is a practicing type designer of graphic of Greek and Latin typefaces. And secondly, we have Miss Pooja Saxena. <laughs> Pooja is a type designer, typographer, and letterer with a focus on Indian scripts. She has studied typeface design at the University of Reading and interned with the Fonts team at Apple. She has worked in the typeface projects of GNOME and Google Fonts, among others. She has also taught at several design schools in India, including the National Institute of Design. And thirdly, we have Mr. Lalindra Nana Karo. Lalindra Nana Karo, Nana, as is known by many, has over 25 years of experience in advertising and communication. He has created iconic campaigns for leading Sri Lankan companies, such as Sri Lanka Telecom, Mobitel, Selinko, and for leading international companies, such as Coca-Cola and Nestle. His work has been featured in the prestigious Lazarus Archive and is the recipient of numerous awards. Currently, he's the Executive Creative Director at Leo Burnett, Sri Lanka. And fourthly, we have Mr. Muthu Nedumaran. Muthu has over three decades of experience in typography. His type designs are now bundled into operating systems like Mac OS, Windows, iOS, and Android. His creation, Inaimati, is used as the standard type for Tamil text by the ministries of education in Singapore and Malaysia. Besides typography, Muthu has also innovated and built fast and efficient input methods for all the languages he works on in various platforms. He is the founder of Murasu Systems. And last but not the least, we have our moderator for the evening, Mr. Patum Megadavatta. Patum is a Sri Lankan typeface designer, font engineer, and a researcher of typography. He specializes in type and typography of South Asian scripts. He has studied at University of Reading and the Academy of Design, Colombo. I had a much bigger introduction, but he cut out the rest of it, so. <laughs> so please uh, give a round of applause for Patum. But he has a big chair. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Cool. Okay, uh, how do I? Ah, yes, okay. Hi. Okay, uh, so uh, <clears throat> if you look at the, the titles, it has some like words like typography, text technologies, and fonts as infrastructure. So, uh, what I'm interested in and what we are trying to talk about today is how fonts and typography and uh, related uh, areas uh, and the intersections of technology and uh, uh, these, these aspects uh, can contribute and how they affect our economy and culture. So I would like to sort of uh, start the discussion uh, with Jerry and uh, what is the relationship of a script and a writing system and uh, the economy and the culture. How does it sort of relate to? It's a, it's a very open-ended uh, question, and then we can uh, go on from okay. that. I uh, think. The, okay, I'll try to narrow it down because indeed it, it is quite an open question, and you can think the script very simply is visual mechanics for encoding a language, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that is quite fluid because it's subjective depending on the tools that people use and also how language involves. 
evolves, and also it can include quite a lot of variations regionally, uh, even within fairly, fairly short uh, periods. Uh, what is, however, interesting is that once you start looking at typographic environments where you have uh, the need to have systematized versions of that script, then the script becomes something much more rich and becomes a typographic script, which means it's a technological issue that involves decisions about what you leave in and what you leave out. It's something that needs to interact with systems, in which case you need to say, what is it possible to do within the technology we have that is close enough to the shapes that people make with their whatever writing tools? And it is also a political issue, because you need to decide which is the reference version of uh, the language that we're going to represent visually. And that is something that applies, again, across cultures. So the, these comments are entirely culture and script agnostic. Uh, but whether your script will accommodate you know, diacritics of a certain kind might mean that you know, French or Polish might be pronounced in a specific way or not, uh, or some uh, part of uh, the community might be marked out as a minority linguistically who needs special treatment so that they can train their children to read in their version of the script. And this is a fairly simple case where you might have a huge overlap in most of the forms in that script, but then the minority also needs a few more diacritics or a few extra characters and so on. The story of turning things that have almost infinite flexibility in their set uh, and uh, configurations, which means whatever you want to do if you're writing by hand, into things that systems allow us to use is always a history of compromise. Uh, it's a huge... Um, it's an unfortunate uh, event in the history of, let's say, visual communication that most of the technology uh, was developed by people using the simplest form of representing language, uh, and that would be Anglo-Saxon English, sort of uh, North American English mostly, uh, which is a form of the Latin script that carries no diacritics. Uh, the configurations of the system are fairly simple. There are no complex rules in the behavior of individual little black bits, depending on what other bits are next to them and so on. So you have similarly a technology that is fairly simple in how it treats the individual units of the system. Therefore, the modularization that we see was possible to achieve with fairly simple technologies throughout the 500 years of typographic development. And everybody else is in trouble. <laughs> because if you want to do anything else, other than fairly simple sort of English style typography, you're in trouble because the character sets might not be large enough or the behavior of the system might not be complex enough to accommodate what you want. You also have uh, quite a lot of systems level approaches. So the simplest thing might be at the systematic level, uh, the modular typography of hand setting doesn't allow things to butt up. You cannot join shapes which is fine for Latin and Greek and Cyrillic, not very good for Arabic, where you have a cascading and connecting script. Uh, so something that's quite integral to the feature of the technology doesn't allow you to do this. So then you might say, OK, I still want to be able to typeset Arabic. Uh, therefore, which are the compromises that I'm willing to make? Essentially means, which are the compromises that I think I can get away with imposing on my audience in order to achieve that kind of thing. So this dialogue always happens. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, in fairly current technology, we have the work that Mutu has been doing, which is a very good example of this, where you might say, I've got a thing that's a little computer. If I want these communities to use them, they need to be able to see their script on. Uh, what is the minimum viable form of that script that people will at least accept so that their messaging will not be terrible? And maybe they will not be doing sort of weird transcriptions of their language in English in Latin characters, which a lot of people do, and we cannot. You know, everybody has done that at some point. But then, how do you move beyond that? So this idea of making a script that is possible to represent uh, at a sufficiently good enough level of fidelity to the forms that people expect to see in its full richness and complexity, and in a way that people can interact with, is absolutely central to then them buying that phone or their computer or making their bookings online or reading that book that came out of print on demand or doing all sorts of services that we expect. Uh, and that is the interesting connection with the theme of uh, the panel where you're saying that, hey, fonts in themselves might or might not be a product in this case, 
but they're absolutely fundamental for all the products that sit above them in a stack. So if I'm saying I'm building a travel business, well, I cannot book my ticket unless I can read the text that will tell me that, uh, because actually it is culturally wrong to force me to do this in English. Uh, and maybe, you know, in 1995, that was an okay compromise because the system was not able to deal with this. But maybe in the last 20 years, the systems can actually allow us quite a lot of complexity in how they support scripts. So therefore, the bar raises. And you need to say, in order to serve that community with respect, I need to be able to represent the script at a certain level that will enable all of these services with the precision that reflects the depth of that culture and those interactions. Yeah, uh, so I, I would like to sort of turn to Mutu from uh, that uh, perspective. So you have worked on supporting uh, the scripts of the region and quite complex uh, scripts and worked on a number of uh, uh, platforms as well. So what challenges do you see sort of common to these uh, supporting these languages and making like enabling uh, computing in, in, in these uh, languages to, to start with. We can uh, sort of go into the other sort of modes of expression and then the, 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 the sort of creative expression in the, the next uh, uh, in the next topics, but uh, I'm interested in sort of discussing this as a, as a functional uh, uh, platform. What are the sort of common things you see in uh, this? Is it on? Yeah. When I first started doing uh, work um, with a non-Latin script, that was like 1985. I was working on a Tamil script because that's the language we speak back in Malaysia. The aim was, I mean, I had no idea what type, typography, or I don't have not even heard the word font at that time. But the goal was to enable someone to um, input, to, uh, you know, create some documents or, or, uh, or text on a computer, because we have already seen the benefit of um, doing that in English, and we want to translate that to Tamil at that time. So. Uh, the, the, you know, there, there were multiple challenges. The first was to display the text on the screen because there was no such thing as true type at the time. And they were like bitmap images. So I'm an engineer. Um, I still am <laughs> <laughs> pretending to be a typeface designer. Um, so I yanked off boards, you know, uh, took off chips, reverse engineered, and figured out how they were rendering uh, the ASCII characters or the Latin uh, text on the computer and then replace those characters that were not used in Malaysia and Singapore, the, the uh, non-English other European letters, and replace them with Tamil, finding my own ways of encoding them. Some letters were like done in two different pieces because they can't sit into uh, you know, the, the given window for a sing single character. And then um, wrote assembler routines <laughs> to allow users to type. All these were trying to accommodate, trying to fit into something that was done for a completely different system, for a completely different language system. Now, you fast forward, uh, I mean, after that, of course, to design fonts for printing and all that stuff came, came along. But fast forward 30 odd years, three over decades, now if I look back, if you ask me, um, uh, was that the right approach? Definitely not. Uh, I would even go and say that a keyboard is probably not the, the correct input tool, a proper input tool for languages in this region. Right? The Chinese, they have done, um, they, I mean, they have adopted the keyboard using a Han Yupinian input method, or they even have strokes. If you, if you write Chinese on a phone, you actually write Chinese. You don't type Chinese. Um, the reason why uh, regional languages are not used in a messaging or other communications because it's so difficult to type, even for people like me. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a native Tamil speaker. I speak Tamil equally uh, well. But it's so difficult to express you know, on, on a keyboard, which, is that, which was designed for some other language. Um, so that, that's, what, that's the goal. That's how we started. And then when I started studying about typography and font design, um, again, we were trying to fit into something that was designed for a system completely alien to us. You know, we had something like an X height, <laughs> we had a baseline, and we had an uh, accent, and we have characters that go beyond that and go below 
uh, especially in, in Indian languages when you have stacked um, uh, consonants that go, you know, downwards. Um, so, but I mean, we don't have a choice. I mean, we didn't invent, invent those systems, so we have to probably uh, accommodate. Uh, but now that, uh, you know, te technology has enabled a lot of things that were not possible before, um, I'm quite excited to go and explore those areas, both in terms of design of uh, typefaces, um, as well as uh, the input method. So I'm still keeping both my interests, engineering and design. <laughs> Um, and I think it's possible uh, doing that. And I, I, and I also think that the world has woken up to realize that there are people who speak languages written in scripts other than Latin. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, during ATI Pi, we had a we had a forum among the the designers of or the creators of the of uh, typeface design tools. Uh, and I think Jerry popped up the question: Is this, when will we see a time when you open file new? Um, it prompts you as is which script you want to create your typeface in, and then gives us the framework for that script instead of giving you an X height and a baseline. So, but that's not too far away. It probably is already happening. So that's it's quite exciting for me, and that's the reason why I started doing this a bit more seriously uh, these days. Yeah, uh, I, I think just to sort of like add on, like in a in a type design software, when we open up a new file, it automatically gives me the, the Latin alphabet uh, uh, boxes to, to fill in, uh, and along with the, the proportions and other things to, to fill out. So I, I think, uh, so so over the years now, we, we are in a, a position where there is the, the technology is enabling uh, higher sort of levels of typographic uh, usages. And uh, for example, uh, I think the, the advertising community in the audience and, and any anybody who's worked with Singhala uh, knows that it's it's really hard to work in InDesign or other uh, uh, tools to uh, uh, like design in Singhala, and uh, actually uh, you can't still use uh, Unicode fonts like OpenType plus Unicode fonts for for a lot of languages. So uh, I'd like to uh, go to Pooja. So you have worked on a number of Indian uh, script and Latin script font projects, uh, and uh, why is making fonts for regional scripts uh, is it like more time consuming and, and different to the, the process of Latin? And uh, uh, what are the inherent challenges and, and in, in design and production of fonts for, for these uh, regions? Um, I guess it would be obvious to most of you that it is much more time consuming to work in a non-Latin script. And um, working in India where, you know, like for instance, today when I was hearing the talks that were happening, I was kind of, uh, you know, uh, when people were discussing how, you know, like for instance, in Sri Lanka, you're looking at three scripts and that kind of, you know, now suddenly accommodates a large part of the population. When you're looking at India and you're looking at multilingual projects, uh, three scripts does not cut it. Uh, so just, just by virtue of that, a multilingual project means, you know, just the scale becomes larger because the number of scripts and languages you need to tackle to reach a large uh, group of people is is so much bigger. Uh, then, of course, there is the obvious part that just the number of you know discrete things you have to design to make you know any of the Indian scripts work is much larger than what you need to design for you know uh, Latin. And similarly, the engineering work that goes in is you know. Uh, much greater. But I think beyond that, what also uh, makes the work greater is that there is a lot of, uh, for the lack of a better word, education around doing a project such as that. I mean, often you will have, uh, you know, say a client come to you with a problem, uh, but they don't actually understand why it's being caused or the very fact that a typeface could solve it. And even if a typeface could solve it, chances are that the people they're working with uh, have no clue how to say even install that typeface and make it work, you know, in any given software. There's also that there is a legacy of using non-Unicode ASCII-based, uh, you know, typefaces, which continues even today. There are newspapers which don't use Unicode compliant typefaces, and there is a lot of resistance to move from that system to one which, to us, is very obviously the better one. But because it has gone on for so long. 
it is a huge challenge to convince people to give up on those and actually move to a new system, which to them feels kind of stupid because in the Askai system, there's only so many characters. To them, it's, it, it makes no sense that suddenly you want to like draw 900 characters. To them, it seems like a waste of time and money economically. And so they may not be, you know, as willing to engage in a activity like that. So I think it's not just that they're complex because the scripts are complex, but I think the situation surrounding those projects are also quite difficult. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I think so. Uh, I would like to move to uh, like uh, uh, Nana with the the question of uh, you are a user of a font and you have a lot of people using fonts under you as well. Uh, and and in in Sri Lanka you have worked on different campaigns. And uh, what are the challenges you face uh, when using the the, the fonts? And also. Uh, planning and executing campaigns in region, uh, local languages uh, in your practice. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, thoughts about uh, sort of multi-script design that, that you have to face uh, in the, the practice. Uh, right. Uh, I think the biggest problem when it comes to local font is the lack of choice. So we end up, when we practice or when we apply uh, it into because I come from communication and advertising background so when we apply it to our day to day work uh, you will find that you know we would use the same font to communicate about a political party maybe sometimes we might even use that font for a biscuit and uh, you know simply because you know we don't have that wide variety that uh, maybe the English fonts have the, so have creating that identity for different brands through the font or through typography gets very limited. And uh, I think another problem that we have is that when you're trying to develop things locally, the process that goes into it, the unfortunately, okay, the you have to come up with a local solution, but the process that tells you to come up with the solution is not local. You know, for example, if you're working in an agency, you would know, okay, the brief that you get, you would never get a Singular brief, no. You will get an English brief, but they will tell you, hey, the it's a mass market product. So come up with a singular, come up with a local concept for it. But the whole thinking that is trying to help you to come up with the solution, the process is not locally managed. So I think that is a big challenge. And obviously the third challenge I would say is cost or the budgets, you know. the So how much can you actually allocate for for typography or for expressing through type because uh, the budgets are i mean it's it's not as big as sometimes that you get in other countries or in other markets you might come up you might have uh, some clients that have much bigger budgets but uh, in reality the only font that we have developed for a client in sri lanka is for sri lankan airlines <laughs> right the, and that was what eight years ago, 10 years ago. But uh, here you tell a client, hey, we want to develop a font. The, I mean, we, we ourselves have tried it. You know, we try to develop fonts for banks. Either the time that they want you, they would want it, hey, can we do it in two weeks or three weeks? The, or <laughs> if you go into a cost proposal, it will go into, oh, no, no, the, the, they would not see the importance of, you know, why, why, you, need to, why you need to have this tool. Yeah, I think uh, that is the the lack of the the selection and lack of the 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 the, the available voices uh, in your as a, as you know you can al almost think about the the fonts as a designer's toolbox uh, for the the voices. I would like to turn to Pooja. To uh, you, you have been doing some research and documentation projects in the, the about Indian languages and sort of using uh, sort of. Uh, uh, the the inspirations and uh, uh, you you wrote on your uh, bio that uh, you draw on uh, their like index scripts rich body of styles and shapes to create lettering uh, with a distinctive identity uh, can you talk about a bit about this identity and how the the lack of fonts maybe uh, affect the the how we express identity um i think one of the things like for instance in indian scripts in the last few years there has definitely been 
a growth in terms of the number of typefaces that are available, not in all scripts, but say a Devanagari, which is a major script, has a lot more typefaces. Uh, but unfortunately, what you see, and I'm party to this having happened, as are most people who design type in Devanagari, is that a lot of designs that have been made are merely extensions of what even Latin type designers often will call boring designs. You know, they are sans serif, they are sort of kind of humanist, maybe some are geometric or some kind of unholy marriage of the two. And they are, you know, they're what brands look like, right? And I don't know if they, they do seem like the kind of fonts which you could use to both sell a political party or a biscuit because, you know, that is that is what they look like. Uh, and I think that is a bit of a sad situation to be in. So, you know, for instance, you see a lot of, um, you know, Latin script-based designers also, for instance, grieve the fact that so many new typefaces look like that. But if you think of it in the context of Indian scripts, it's even worse because that is then the majority of the typefaces you have, right? So which is really unfortunate. So it is in that kind of context that I say that it's possible for one, designs to not start as, um, you know, something that is matched to a Latin typeface but perhaps possible that something starts from another script, even if it then includes Latin, right? So then you're coming to things from a different perspective. Also, potentially the resources, the visual resources you might be referring to become quite different rather than looking at things Latin only. Um, so yeah, mostly that, that it's possible to sort of start whether it's lettering or typefaces from the perspective of another script rather than from Latin. And I think that itself would help have more distinctive designs and therefore bring like a sense of identity through those designs. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, the, the designers in the region and also even in, in, in Sri Lanka, currently we are seeing sort of looking back and uh, looking around for, for more uh, inspiration and sort of drawing inspiration from uh, those things. But uh, I would like to sort of uh, come back to the, the idea of uh, uh, the, the, the standards and, and, and technology to uh, cover things a bit. Uh, uh, I would like to turn to Jerry. So, um, uh, so we spoke about this variety and the, the issues that we see. So uh, one of the, the main uh, aspects of uh, establishing the, the technology and the, the tools and uh, uh, other uh, resources for uh, typography or scripts is uh, developing universal standards uh, for the, the writing systems. So when we are talking about universal standards, it means by definition we have to sort of smooth out uh, certain things, right? Uh, so what how does uh, the 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 process of this developing standards would uh, affect the the identity and like the nature of the 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 script and the culture? Yes, uh, I mentioned already the problem of the character set of what goes in there. So somebody needs to decide how many characters do you need at the minimum to say I support this language, uh, and I say at a minimum because most companies will work on a basis of. It works 90-80% of the time for 98% of the users for 98% of the documents because there are quite a lot of um, fairly uh, detailed or extreme document types that might need specialist use. But if you say, what's, what are the, what's the range of documents most people see during the daily life, that might be a good starting point. Uh, and then once you try to see the complexity of the communities or if you start searching into time, that might change. But let's say you've got a pretty good idea of what the character set is. Let's say also you're, you've got a really good access to uh, manuscript uh, evidence that tells you what are the, um, uh, the configurations of the arrangement of the shapes uh, without them being, let's say, intervened or polluted by the compromise of intermediate technology. So if I want to find out how do I support properly Tamil or Sinhala, I shouldn't be looking, say, at handset Tamil or Sinhala because that was already compromised so that it would fit there. I might need to go and say, I need to look at manuscript sources just to get an idea of what are the configurations of shapes. Uh, is there variation between shapes or not? And then I would probably need to look at different formalities of documents and across different periods. And that you can do it. It's a research project, you can do it. So you might think, okay, tick, support the script. 
Uh, I'm going to leave aside the hyphenation uh, and the spelling documents. If the language hyphenates, you need to have proper hyphenation uh, dictionaries in the system. If it doesn't hyphenate, you need to have routines that tell you how to arrange things in columns. Do uh, you need to spell check the thing? Um, we mentioned Arabic earlier. Arabic is not a thing that you can spell check. It's a script. You might have languages that use the script, and each of them needs a knob on your document that says, oh, I'm using this kind of Arabic for my, the, I'm typing this kind of Arabic because if I'm typing like, the Arabic spoken in Egypt or in Syria or in Libya, they might be used different spellings. So that's another thing of, oh, I support the script or not. That, let's leave that aside. But then, so you've got all of that stuff. You've got this amazing system that will sort of arrange the shapes in time. But what does support mean? Because at one end of the scale, uh, you might say, support means I can enable someone to hit a keyboard or make a scratch on the screen or whatever, and something that looked like a good enough representation of the script will appear on screen. Uh, at the worst end of the scale, it might be a typewriter. Uh, and we think, OK, that's a really poor technology tool. We're going to accept a lot of compromises there. At the other end of the scale, it might be a phone that should do a pretty good job. But that's just me speaking in a very monotone voice, and all the texts sound exactly the same, whether they're political parties or they're advertising for detergent. And it, that's the typographic equivalent of having one font. So this sort of, my knob has gone from zero to one. I can support a script in the way that it will not die out, and I can ensure that the stuff that people say or want to encode will survive. That's a, not a very interesting level. It's essential for scripts, but it doesn't get you very far. So maybe it's sort of knob two of support means I can do transactions. I can enable schools, businesses, your bank account to operate, uh, functions of the everyday life. It might be, oh, I need to go to the ATM and get money out, and that thing needs to give me enough differentiation so I can tell the difference between this is just the machine talking to me, and this is a button that I interact with. Or if I've got a school document, this is the voice of the teacher that tells me, fill out the letters, and this is the voice of the student, which is I need to copy these things. So maybe there's a two or three different traditionalism or innovation uh, or conservatism that is reflected in the script. Because if you say, I'm going to use the same typeface for a progressive party and a conservative party, then I need to rely on a lot of other things to get the message across. Uh, if I want to say this kind of book is traditional literature that's very historical, and this thing is a very radical manifesto about sort of rethinking how we do social welfare, probably I need a different kind of typography for this. Uh, we might also say, and that taps into your comment, uh, oh, a lot of the scripts in India are modulated. And that's a traditional impression we get growing up in India. Certainly, if you're my generation, you grew up with a lot of the scripts being modulated. Therefore, you might say, oh, modernity is what my parents didn't do. Uh, therefore, I want something that looks different than what I grew up with. And actually, we know pretty well that what I've seen between, I don't know, four, when I have memories, and about 16, uh, is my, what I think is normal, if I'm a normal person. You have to be really reflective to see through that. So then I will rebel if I want innovation by going against what I grew up with. Oh, I saw modulated the Vanagari when I was growing up, and my school books were full of that stuff. So modernity will be something that's monoline. Now, probably. The young students who are growing up with monoline Devanagar on their phones now every day, they'll grow up and say, this is just so boring and monotonous, and my parents' texts are so sort of lacking of character. I'm going to seek innovation and identity in something that is more modulated and rich. And as it happens, maybe modulated styles might give you more potential to express this richness. But we've seen this in a number of scripts where imported ideas, usually of modernity and identity, from scripts that have this more developed, which is usually the Latin, because a lot of design education imports these ideas, have been saddled on top of traditional forms of the script by a generation that is seeking to identify itself with modernity. And it usually happens that people have imported a low contrast, more technical looking style as modern and innovate, innovative and so on, simply because they're rebelling against the modulated style. We go through this, we have to take a deep breath, run through the next 10 years, 
and then say, OK, can we now return some, to something a bit more rich and interesting? We can do it. The trick is to make sure that the designers of these typefaces actually keep investigating the potential of the scripts to provide this richness and this opportunity for identity, because that would be closer to the development of the scripts. So it has more richness, because it's connecting to the richness of the forms that people made by hand, or the lettering they made. And it is also something that allows you to develop richness without reference to external factors. And especially if you're talking about traditions of writing that go back hundreds or thousands of years, they're pretty certain to have that kind of richness inside them. There are exceptions, so there are invented scripts, that, which happened in the 19th century. Some guys shot, shut down and said, I'm going to invent a script for Cherokee. Okay? Uh, there you don't have the same kind of depth of writing that will give you the sense of modernity. But in Devanagari, you've got it. It goes back a few thousand years, the roots of it. So there's probably enough richness in the forms that you can do it. And the burden falls on educators to impress on students the need to be aware of this richness, uh, and also authorities, again, to see the richness that is possible to combine a sense of modernity with also something that reflects the depth of tradition and form making in the culture. Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the richness of the, the, the typographic palette and the, what, what's available for us is an issue that uh, we are facing in Sri Lanka, like uh, especially for Singhala. We have a set of uh, fonts which were developed around uh, 20 years ago, which have been in, in use in the advertising and publishing industry forever. Uh, uh, so I, I would like to turn to uh, Nana again with the, the, the question of, uh, with the end of the war and uh, with the sort of new developments that we are seeing, there's a huge expansion of the, the, the businesses and, and, and also uh, the, the opportunities that we see. So with these new businesses rising, and uh, uh, what are the sort of new challenges that you see? And uh, do you see uh, uh, specific challenges in this context which relates to typography and, and use of letters? Yeah, on that one, I think the I, I I would disagree on you on one thing. That I think the boom didn't happen as much as we wanted it to. You know, the we expected like a this massive change to happen, the society to change, the thinking to change, but uh, it has taken some time for it to come. And uh, right now, if you take a look at the market, the because the I won't say it's a downturn, but like the economy is not moving as fast as we would like it to. So because that the, there are behavioral changes that happen in consumers. So one of the biggest challenges is consumers then start seeing how can they get the best for their buck or their behavior of you know, how can they manage with the limited resources they have. So you would find things like the, the people will, will spend less time in supermarketing than they would maybe the there's more people now going to polar to see what can they either they can get fresh or they can get it cheaper and uh, that same thing will happen not just in in consumer commodities but like in other commodities as well so there the, in that way the onus falls on us then how can we talk smarter how can we develop voices or develop looks and feels that will create an identity for the different brands that we have so they are the then the then you have that importance of fonts also coming in because if you're going to develop an identity for different brands, you need to have different tools to be able to do that. So in that way, it's I would say it's quite rich right now that uh, for us to start that discussion to say hey there is a need for us to develop these different voices or different types for different needs. Because right now the market will need it. Otherwise, you know, we would all end up looking same, same. Uh, uh, and maybe you know the push clients into a long term to help help them also to see that there are, there are certain things that you need to find solutions long term. You know, developing a font voice or developing a type for themselves is not a short term solution. It's a long term solution. So to help people realize, hey, if you do that now 
the they said that uh, during the recession during the world war recession the brands that actually communicated during that time rather than cutting down are the ones that created a strong voice for themselves you know i remember this uh, example of this milk it's a uh, ready to drink milk when it came into the market i i happened to work in the agency that was doing then you know the when they launched it the results are phenomenal you know they had a 16 600% growth because there was no other competitor and what they did they just launched it and that's it they didn't do anything 3 4 years later there were four competitors and this brand today is not even among the top four because so many others have come because they thought okay the if people are buying it you know you don't need to communicate but you need to communicate and when you when you when there is a need for you to communicate then even typography plays a big role yeah uh, uh, thanks so uh, i think uh, i'll just uh, jump into this uh, idea of so every time when the the market expands or the the new requirements arises then there is a need for or the the medium sort of expand right so when we were when uh, we were trying to figure out how to develop fonts uh for the publishing industry and the publishing frameworks and the tools uh then uh, we are here in sri lanka trying to figure this out and then we have the the mobile phones coming in and then the new technologies all these coming in and then when we have a smaller market when the 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 size of the market doesn't sort of uh, uh allow uh, an investment into developing the technologies there is an uh, issue so what are the sort of challenges you see in you're an engineer but uh, the, the, yes yeah so uh, developing so or adapting to new technologies and new mediums uh, while these changes are happening for the these markets uh, what, do you see any specific challenges and i'm actually interested said about sort of shared challenges that you see across uh, uh, languages i think the the issue of the market if you're looking at it as a opportunity for business development um the issue of the market size being small uh, does play a part if you only stick to that particular market um but if you look at the languages of the region they all share common features they, are, they all share uh, some there are there is some commonality because they all emerge from the same um uh, you know fundamental the brahmi uh, family of scripts um so i i would probably expand into into the region and see how we can uh, we use our expertise in uh, other uh, scripts or other uh, regional scripts as well uh that can be challenging uh, it can uh, impose a lot of a lot of uh, constraints in the in the way you look at i mean when you look at a, a foreign script um, you probably can understand and you can recognize how beautiful it is but you may not understand how it flows what are, what are the the inherent nature of the script how do people write it um, and we need to understand it before we can start developing something or designing something for that or find people who are, who are able to help us understand that so i took the second uh, way um in in uh, finding people who will be able to just tell me that this is how this works this is how it works um uh, this looks native to me it just doesn't i can't connect to this uh, at all um i've also seen the reverse happening when uh, people design uh, uh type faces for the south indian scripts or even sinhala scripts that doesn't come from a calligraphic background and they start introducing calligraphic uh, uh texture to to the southern well it doesn't look natural to me it looks nice it looks beautiful but it you know it doesn't uh, connect so these are ways we can uh, cross germinate uh, ideas to uh, develop new uh, type faces and introduce them to, to the market and see you know, uh, people accept that that's one way i i find Uh, so i would like to just uh, come back to the word uh, infrastructure what is infrastructure what does it mean and how does it relate to the 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 things that we have been talking about so uh, by uh, sort of uh, looking at the the definitions of infrastructure just to get an idea so it's a 
shared resources with high cost but covers basic functionality of a, of a system. Uh, so how does this uh, idea of uh, considering uh, typography and the, the, the fonts as infrastructure to the, the, the function of the design process of a, of a designer uh, sort of uh, help to understand the common problems and, and uh, maybe invest in more developments together to do, do things. So this is some idea, one of the ideas that we have been exploring. Uh, uh, how, what can we do as type people or people interested in, in typography in general to, to push this idea forward and sort of uh, share more things? I'd like to turn to Jerry. I think we covered already the idea that in fonts are opposite the plumbing of communication. You have it. If you don't have the fonts, your documents don't work, your economy doesn't work. Yeah, you can watch Netflix videos all day. That's not an economy. That's just what you do after you're tired all day, building up the economy. But anything that regards interactions, regards the good documents, fonts are absolutely essential in this. And because the range of our interaction are complex fonts, again, cannot be of one only appearance, one only style, one only behavior. They do need to have a richness that corresponds to the richness of our kind of interactions. Again, in terms of formality and in terms of association we make with them. And that is something that shouldn't need too much explaining, because if you just look at the kinds of documents that someone who is active in the economy comes across every day, either actively or passively, they do represent a completely huge range of tones of voice and at degrees of attention and interaction. So I think it's quite appropriate that fonts <coughs> also respond to this. For any society that wants to be operating as a mature economy on that level, instead of I enable rich interactions between the members of the society so they can be productive, the fonts are an essential part of this interaction. What is also interesting that it taps into uh, benefits on top of just the functionality of the document. So, uh, yes, a, a font that makes my banking application look okay and functional uh, will enable me to make my transactions. It also builds trust to the institution. I leave aside whether we want to have trust to the banks, <laughs> but it then means that I actually have an institutional relationship that's reinforced with, uh, through, uh, through the typography map because it looks sufficiently close to all the other emissions of communication by the bank. If my banking app looked very different than my desktop version of the app or the browser or the stuff I get in the post, I'd be thinking, that's not very coordinated. Is this a different team? Or do they keep different records from my bank account that that team and so on? So you want to see how these things connect. If the, the state talks to me with a different typographic voice when it sends me my tax bill and when it sends me my utility bills or it sends me a notification that the road works down outside my house, is it different authorities or is it coordinated? Uh, that actually has taken place in a lot of countries in Europe now where uh, public authorities at different levels, all the way from the government to regional authorities, develop their own branding typefaces. And you would think, hold on, you're spending tax money on brands? But the answer is, because we spent tax money on uh, the road cleaning and the garbage collection and the schools, I want you to know every time you see the garbage truck that it's your money that pays for it. And what does it is the fact that the typography is controlled in a way that says, oh, this is the state garbage truck, and not some private company that we're paying probably a premium for to do this for us. So again, you see the public voices using typography uh, through typeface choices to control the messaging that they give to the community. And that's essential because if you want to put a message on the side of a garbage truck and also the hospital and also the pavement, you can't really do it in many, many ways other than just falling back on a typeface that has consistent typographic arrangements. So it becomes a very important political tool to build consistency in a community and the perceptions and the relationships with authorities. And you might say, what sort of infrastructure is this? Well, that's political infrastructure because it helps the relationships between different layers in society to operate smoothly. Uh, so if you're trying to think, how do I build a well-functioning community? 
the first thing you want to do is to ensure that the communication relations between them in their full richness can be supported well in a way that reinforces the sense of identity in the community in a healthy way. It allows it to interact with other communities, internationally primarily, with a sense of confidence in itself, and also to grow its local economy internally with others. And I think that is quite at the heart of this. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would like to sort of uh, look at how this sort of identity and, and, and this discussion could uh, sort of feed into uh, people working on the fonts and developing fonts and how we can uh, try and address, uh, you know, as, as designers in the, the audience, a lot of you work with the, the fonts and, uh, you know, it, it could be multi-script uh, projects or it could be a, a single script, a single language project in Sri Lanka or any other place. But uh, there could be uh, this sort of synergy and the discussion. There should be a discussion between the, the people making the fonts and people uh, using the fonts. Uh, I think so. Uh, as I would like to turn to Pooja regarding this, like, how do you think this this uh, this sort of uh, uh, discussion uh, with the the type makers and the the type users is evolving in the the, the region in India? How, how what have what have you seen as a as a designer? And uh, also maybe like after the move, can also add a, a bit to that. Um, I think one of the things that is definitely happening a lot in India currently is for a lot of apps to now support multiple Indian languages, which say wasn't the case even five or six years ago. And it's interesting because a lot of these apps are those which now have to do very basic functions, the kind that you're talking about. So for instance, a few years ago, um, you know, there was a huge push and it continues to be there about going cashless. Right? So for everyone to use an app to pay for things. So it suddenly involved a larger number of people and in the past people were okay with just having communication in English because those were the people with money. Or anybody with that amount of money could also speak English and was quite comfortable in you know, just communicating in that language. Because of the way the economy has turned out, the, the number of people that businesses are trying to communicate to is larger and they all speak you know, different languages and so there's a need to speak to them in those languages. The unfortunate thing is that nobody, I mean, if you study design, I don't think there is a single sort of program in the entire country which focuses on anything except Latin. So if you're a designer who studied in India, uh, you don't even know how to get in design to make a Devanagri font work. You just don't know how to do it. So in that sense, even though a large number of people today are expected to work in a multi-script sort of situation, most of them just do not have, uh, they just don't have the basic knowledge to be able to do that. Even when they can do that, you see really, I mean, kind of strange things like for instance, a lot of um, news outlets, online ones, now will have one or two more languages supported apart from uh, Latin and they're going to basically use the same uh, CSS for let's say the Devanagri. So in the Latin, which they've done rather well, they would have kerned, uh, sorry not kerned, they would have tracked the headlines tighter because you know it's a little loose and you do that to Devanagri and it'll mean that you're going to have some pretty unsightly clashes. But it just doesn't even strike people that that might be a problem because they've never really spent any time even typing those languages. So to sort of turn your question around, I think a lot of what is required is right now infrastructure so that typography could be used rather than just thinking of typography as infrastructure for people to use. I think right now people just don't know how to even use it. So I think it is at that level that the engagement first needs to happen, which is both like at the college level but also people who are already working as designers to just learn how these scripts and languages even work. Now, in terms of requirements, and I agree with Pooja that the introduction of the, the, the smartphone and the apps have actually increased the demand um, for uh, a, a different variety of typefaces, even for apps that are released in this region from these languages. 
Now the earlier problem we had was to just make the script work. You know, to get it to work uh, flawlessly was already a challenge. So design was not even the question. Does it work? I mean, can it read? Can people read? Especially Cinella. I mean, there are some apps that are still having problems. Um, well, I don't even want to go to the, the, to the Indo-Chinese languages because the Khmer is is it's such a complex uh, uh, combination of letters that you know software is struggling to do that. But anyway, we, the, that was a challenge. That was an early challenge. So to make it look nice was a secondary uh, requirement. To make it look, make it work was a primary requirement. But today, especially with you know with the boom of, of mobile gaming in this part of the world, um, you know people are just tired with with standard UI fonts, fonts that are designed for buttons and labels. They don't work on on say a, a game that is supposed to be like fun and you know adventure and going into the. I mean you can't just go and put it. Like a Times Roman looking font in there, so that's actually increasing. Uh, I mean, that's that's a kind of um, request we get from the industry. Is to say, we need a font that kind of uh, matches this, that looks like a jungle, that looks like this, that looks like this. Um, I think that's a good sign that, that people are actually beginning to see uh, uh, that uh, users in this region are looking for that kind of variety or that kind of genre. And that, that probably can be a seed uh, for, for future uh, design development of uh, varieties of package development in regional languages. Thanks. Uh, so we'll take some questions later on, so you can like uh, start preparing if you have any questions for the, uh, uh, the, the panel. Uh, I would like to turn to uh, Nana to ask this uh, question about uh, the, the expansion of the, 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 the type and the, the usage. Whether uh, uh, we, you know, we, we, we spoke about the, the so Pooja spoke about like the, the information that we need to disseminate about the, the usage, fonts or technicalities and other things. Uh, is this something that you have seen the, the, the lack of knowledge in, in Sri Lanka? Is it something that you face uh, on on a day to day basis in the, the industry regarding uh, these these things, uh, the, the language use and and. Uh, no, I won't. Um, I won't say it's a lack of knowledge. The, it's it's a good thing that uh, we have we have additional mediums now that we have to play on. Uh, because if you take like five five six years ago, maybe the, it was very much print driven. But now the mediums that we have to work on it's like multiple. So from gaming platforms to screens to audio visual so so that uh, the demands have also increased so i think that that's a good thing and that is kind of pushing you to look for solutions and look for ways that okay what uh, how can how can we make type work in that uh, maybe there is a lack of knowledge when it comes to when it comes to typographers and actually designers uh, because uh, most of the people I would say in communication, advertising and communication, the, we don't come with a typography background uh, or we, we are not skilled in that. We, we kind of learn as you, as you go along, uh, most of them I would say. So whereas the, I think the younger generation now has seen the need for it and actually guys like you coming in and uh, talking about type and, uh, and specifically you know working on type as the, I mean, I've seen young people who, who now don't want to be art directors they want to be designers or they want to be graphic designers and ironically there, there are some people who want to be type of typographers which was not a case some time back so but there, there are there is a gap between knowledge that we have some some designers and uh, and what what can be done but I think the newer generation and the people who are getting trained more and getting exposed more are kind of closing that gap yeah uh, I think uh, another thing is like uh, we are developing like vocabulary and also like ways to talk about certain things uh, which which is like a, uh, an issue you know like when we talk about uh, matching a, a singular and a, a Latin uh, 
uh, typefaces or in a, in a design how to uh, work with those things i think uh, we don't have the the necessary vocabulary to 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 explain these things which uh, some of the in the, the development that we'll see uh, in the future is i think sort of developing vocabulary and the, the frameworks to talk and uh, discuss about these things uh, the new issues that are coming up you know right now what are the issues that that we have right now I mean, bill path is an issue stray dog is an issue and the type that you need to talk for talk about those issues would be quite different you know the it's no more just communication solutions that you have to come up with but there are issues that you have to come with solutions for and those issues will need actually the the type that you use to come up with solutions for those needs is very important and it also it needs to have its own voice and its own distinct identity uh, yes, uh, exactly. I think uh, I would uh, like to turn to the audience if you have any questions or ideas to uh, at the the at this discussion. Yes, feel free to. You have the the microphone which you can turn on and uh, yeah. I think another big problem that we have in Sri Lanka is when it comes to design, people expect it free. Right? So, you know. <laughs> but that's a problem. I mean, the, you know, we would, not, we would not go to a doctor and say, hey, can you do a checkup for me as a portfolio job, right? The, or go to an architect. You know, it's an, it's an opportunity. Hey, can you do this project because it's an opportunity, opportunity job. But when it comes to designing or when it comes to typography, we would say the we are not the society is being told or the designers are being told, hey, that uh, what you are bringing to the table is not is not economically viable. And I, and I think that conversation needs to change because for for typography also to be given that importance. It needs to become economically viable. That people, more and more people will be getting to it simply because you, you know you actually can make a living out of it, or that, that there would be a there would be a benefit to you. But like after years of you know putting in into design, after after investing in machinery, you know, and learning so much, but if you are going to if you are not going to be paid for it, then you would look for other ways for you to get that income. So that would. It would mean you know you would ra rather than being a typographer you would be an art director, so, which actually is sad. But I think that conversation is good that we are having that and that needs to continue for for the society to change to say hey, if it's design, you know, I saw this nice one uh, on FB once. If the people think that it's, it's it's quite easy, but it's not, right? The and it, it, what it said was you know if you think it's so easy, why don't you do it yourself, right? And we need to <laughs> we need to tell people hey. Uh, that's the same thing. The, you, the reason why you bring a designer in is because you want design, and if a design is coming in, that design is not coming with just uh, gut feeling. That design is coming with a background. It will be coming with training. He will come. He is coming with so many years, that, so many hours that he has put into honing that craft. Uh, they are coming with the you know with, with educational qualifications or with the or with training that has gone into that person. They are coming with machinery that they have invested in, in how to develop themselves to be where they are right now. So for that, there is a cost. Yeah, I think uh, sort of uh, sometimes like um, in my personal experience, uh, talking about type and typography, uh, sometimes sort of shift the this is not going to like change the clients who want like things for free. <laughs> I, uh, but uh, uh, sort of making a case for for design in, in some cases, sort of investing in, in, in design. So when it comes to fonts and, and uh, typography and typefaces, where I found sometimes it's easier to make it, uh, when, when you go uh, take this route of functionality, you know, you have to communicate and, and also talking about the, the identity, expressing the identity through type also as a function uh, rather than a sort of decorative element. I think uh, that's something that we see changing uh, in, in maybe in Sri Lanka and the, the region, sort of like shifting design from sort of producing pretty things to actually looking at uh, like 
functional uh, aspect. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, Say, there's a saying that no, when it's well designed, nobody's going to notice it because it looks perfect. But then there is lack of design, people are going to say there's something wrong with it. So that's the role of the designer. So and it's happening more and more that people people are being exposed and I mean people travel, people the people are using products that are designed well. So people want actually design in their lives. Uh, I think one of the things you mentioned is also relevant in what's the language you use for the client? And you mentioned earlier the case of Sri Lanka. Uh, so the person who authorizes the spend of a few hundred thousand to buy a custom font for an airline is not a designer. It's someone it's way above a designer. It's someone who really doesn't care about design but knows they need to have a distinctive identity because their airline needs to look different than the others. And that person will probably understand the economic argument. If you spend that much money now, then for the next however many years you own this intellectual property and if you decide that you want to print Sri Lankan on the napkins, you can do it. If you want to change the uniforms of your personnel, you can do it and you don't have to pay extra. If down the line you decide to have an app that says, oh, Sri Lankan, I can check online, then you can bundle your font in there and it's yours. You own it. So actually the investment has a much longer life than if you license something. That when you decide, oh, I want an app, you have to extend the license. It might be quite more expensive. So that kind of language is possible to have, but you need to speak that the language that the client understands. It might be of intellectual property, of rights, of extensibility of contracts, of length of contracts and so on, of any assets that they have. And you're talking about type because it's infrastructure, the same way that he's talking about his fuel supply contracts. Uh, and for them, it's just one more asset in a long list of assets, even though we think, oh, it's special. Well, it's not. It's something that they need to get their business done. Uh, and they might treat it the same as they treat a contract for you know, pilot supply or whatever. And a lot of the designers often think that they need to talk about design, as you say, as a set of designed objects rather than something that has a certain value in enabling other functions of the company or the client to operate. Uh, and I think that is often uh, a problem in design education where we might not train graduates uh, certainly at bachelor's level, to have these kind of conversations. We, they go through because they have to defend their projects, they talk about their projects, their presentations. We don't necessarily put them enough in front of clients who might be lawyers or managers or accountants and say, talk now about your project in that person's language. I, I think that's uh, something that that you find out as a fresh graduate, like going out how to make a case. You know, you're you're so used to sort of like uh, defending the the projects rather than like trying to make the the case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do we have it? Yeah. yeah, I think it's we're just talking about how we need to articulate the value of fonts and typefaces to the client. I think that's. You know, we're bringing very intangible value to a brand or whatever. But I think if we're talking about brand image, it's about differentiation. But we're talking something deeper than that, which is uh, user experience or brand experience. Uh, because it's about, you know, how you um, experience a product or service. And it's not just an image that you're projecting. I think increasingly, you know, with apps, and digital services and platforms, we are actually, you know, um, using typefaces as part of a, a larger scheme of things in terms of user experience. And I think that's the value. And you know, if the typefaces plays a big role in improving user experience, more people, more clients get on board of the services. Then there are some tangible things that we can tell the clients. Look, you know, this is really bringing in value because you know you've increased your client base, etc. So, yeah, yeah uh, uh, it's a little bit. Uh, the question is about something that we were discussing in the morning about uh, you know typography and type design being such a low risk practice that I'm wondering how one can start a dialogue about 
uh, understanding the importance of typographic sensitivity to an audience we we spoke a little bit about you know clients or people who are maybe making the investment but what about the people who are consuming this type they're not consuming the type they're consuming the product or the service so if you take what keith said we talked about earlier uh, where does the value get created from the moment where i first come into contact with a service or a brand or whatever up to the point where i finish my transaction which might be i've done my banking thing or i bought my trip or whatever you can actually plan there is uh, where the value gets created in different stages of the interaction, the risk that the uh, user might abandon the service and might choose somebody else, oh, because, oh, I like the product, but then there wasn't a reinforcement of my relationship with that, therefore I abandoned it for a competitor and so on. So you can see all of these sort of nexus points along this relationship. And type usually is quite central in all of these things, but it's never the type that the user really pays. Like, oh, nice letters. No, I can use the UI. I can actually book my ticket, I can get my service. So this idea of value that's generated, of risk that is controlled, that is, I think, what the users respond to. And we know from our own experience and for observe, from observations of how people interact that people are pretty terrible at distinguishing details between different things, but are extremely adept at determining different patterns. So they'll be able to tell just by driving the street, oh, that this ATM belongs to this bank and this ATM belongs to that bank simply because the pattern of the type or the colors or the combination of them reminds them of that kind of interaction. And if you ask them, why can you tell that this is a Barclays? Uh, I don't know, it's a Barclays thing. I don't know, it's a Barclays thing. Yeah. And it might have to do with the texture of the type. Uh, there is some very interesting uh, recent research that is really crazy. Uh, with some um, archaeologists that uncovered, and I hope I reproduced this correctly, because this is really not my field, uh, that were looking at the very first markings that uh, proto-humans made in caves, long before they scratched uh, pictures of people hunting animals. And the very first kind of scratching they made were fairly abstract representations and they were elementary ideas of symbols or counting and so on. So from the very early evolutionary uh, uh, days of humanity as a communicating species, we have things that are actually patterns of things, patterns of lines uh, in small symmetrical arrangements, which look very much like forms of a script that you can't read. And the arguments that they were making, because they're trying to connect this to the acquisition of writing systems and so on, was that these fundamental configurations of shapes uh, are, uh, have conditioned our brain to respond very well to recognizing these differences in patterns. Uh, so therefore, we are evolutionarily conditioned to respond well to things that look like configurations, symbolic configurations of letter forms, much more so than a uh, configuration of petals in a flower. Uh, and from that, you can see that maybe we are quite well evolved to recognize these small differences between patterns of shapes. Uh, somebody in the morning was talking about textures and uh, the, the feeling of uh, paragraphs. Uh, and that's fine. It means I don't need to really tell in what way these things are different. I just need to be able to tell that they are different enough and that then allows me to make emotional associations with that stuff. Q then, the value that allows me to say, this is the trustworthy bank, and the letters on this ATM is something I do not recognize. Maybe all the stories I've heard about ATMs that will steal my card are about this one. I'm not going there. And then that's exactly how it works. Um, coming back to, I think, Nana's point, which you stated, uh, people want a return to, uh, for their buck. Um, ultimately, how would you calculate the return on investment if a client was to invest in, in, a, in say, a corporate fund for themselves? I mean, how would you um, calculate the return that you would generate? Hello. Okay. <laughs> when it comes to convincing someone, you need multiple bullets in your gun. Right? 
the you can't you can't uh, you can't hit them with only one and you know knock them down right so one would be the I- that it creates you an identity the other one can be on the on the question that you asked as well the that this thing the the competition is high you know the right now the economy is tight so the the brand also needs to differentiate itself the whole this brand experience what we, what he was talking about the each brand needs to you know have that differentiation and type really plays a great part in doing that the it, but type is not the only thing that's going to create that but type definitely is is, a, is the is the foot forward in that so that would be one and then but uh, what jerry was saying was the the investment it's not a one time investment it's a long term it gives you long term returns so make your make your case with multiple arguments to sell it to a client and then even the i mean i've seen uh, we, are, we are having a separate conversation in patum on how to train the guys at in my office the how can we train the they train the art directors to know more about type Uh, you know i i've seen his portfolio of work so that would help client to see hey the then show them examples of what has worked in different markets the so that they they realize hey it, it actually works and even the exa- even the simple example of you know the 10 years ago how much did sri lankan airlines i think they paid about almost half a million bucks just to develop that type and half a billion bucks at that time is equivalent to about you no know, 4 5 million now considering inflation so so those are like so have have multiple arguments and uh, and hopefully we would have actually people investing in type because uh, because it is important and if certain and i mean this example of you know if certain countries even the, if the government services are using that you know the in that way the private brands have much bigger budgets that they can play with so because uh, i mean uh, i worked with M- i worked at ms before uh, before burnet and uh, that was one conversation that we were having okay how can we develop a font to this big company because uh, over 5000 machines you know and uh, i mean they, they are present in 16 countries you know that brand needs to communicate in one voice if i i'll just add to that i think uh, one of the you spoke about like having like so many computers uh, i think licensing is licensing the cost of licensing is one of the the biggest arguments that uh, uh, that is being used in a lot of international companies developing their own fonts because uh, how font licensing works is you know you you install it in on one computer and then there's a limit to the the usage or the number of computers that you can <coughs> Uh, that you can install so uh, sort of instead of buying a license you can develop your own so it's a co- it's cost effective in in scale and i think uh, clients always i think in any context they like to feel special so uh, sort of uh, addressing the the specific needs is something i think uh, that that could work for for example uh, a banking institute uh, would need a font which has uh, maybe all the currency symbols because they have right uh, or or they might need you know they could then use it you know making case for the 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 whole spectrum of things that they do from you know for a bank i would say you know you can use it in your all all, uh, all your material and then that font can be engineered and designed specifically to those needs uh, so like uh, the the currency symbols is a very sort of you know clear example but i think when you look at the the industries you can sort of go into the the specific clients you know workflows and things they do and maybe uh, figure figure this out uh, yeah just to to add i mean if you look around the examples of this are numerous uh, anything that has to do with wayfinding has a bunch of arrows uh, what are you using some sort of generic uh, string of arrows that might have corners and angles that have nothing to do with the shapes of the letters and might look much darker or much lighter or are you using arrows that are coordinated with the style and weight of your typeface if you have a typeface that will respond differently to whether it's positive or negative depending on it whether it's black on white or white on black 
do all the elements also adjust their weight accordingly so that it will render correctly? Uh, if you have to send that typeface to somebody who will make the signs, who runs their plotter or the sort of vinyl cutter or whatever, then if you have the font, then you actually have the right to give it to them. Uh, a normal license for a commercial one would not allow you to do them, would require them to buy another copy of the license so that they can install it on their machine, which you will have to pay on their invoice. It also might mean that they might be able to make small change the font, or the font already exists on their system with small changes, which might create substitutions. Then you might want to send your email out to people, and increasingly you see circulars having things like emojis in. Now, at the moment, we don't see emojis being part of brands. Uh, I'm pretty sure that within three years, tops, a lot of brand projects will include their own emojis because we're not at the stage where a lot of commercial newsletters go out with emojis in the headings or in the text. Five years ago, this didn't happen. Emojis would be used by young people for informal communication. But now, it's part of quite a lot of standard communication. So if you're, you know, again, Vodafone or something, and you're sending a newsletter with emojis, why would your emojis look exactly like the random emojis that somebody gets on iMessage or Facebook or something? Because their weight might be different, the colors are completely odd, you might want to control the symbolism of specific emojis. So maybe your typeface also has its own set of emojis, not a full set, you don't need to do everything, but the ones that you want to use for your brand communications, and maybe, you want to have a couple of different sets that might only work in a specific way for black and white, or ones that are for color, or ones for screen, and so on. So then your custom typeface is a typeface that has, yes, has the letters, but it has a lot of other stuff that will enable a smooth and consistent communication across all the different platforms that you're using. Then again, I mentioned wayfinding. What about the little icons, the little sort of men and women walking, and the little children, and so on? Are they just random icons that are fished from some, uh, uh, what is the ding pot font? Well, if you spent all the money actually to have a control system and so on, where maybe the shape of the figures is also related to the visual language that we are rolling out. So you might want to say these will also be controlled. And you can see the importance of this when you see big schemes for pictograms for large events like the Olympics that are around the corner or similar events in big transport systems where they would be totally designed to try to get all of these things to work well. Now, and one thing you made this, they work well also means that they don't break the system in the sense that I don't need three different fonts to typeset a single sign, one for the arrows, one for the letters, one for the symbols. I can bundle everything in one font. It will render much more cleanly through any production process. So there are multiple benefits to thinking a bit more holistically about the typefaces. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nushka, and I don't come from a typography background, but a translation background. I'm a translator too, and I own a translation company called We Translate. So we do also like, it's very like, must be ba really basic, but we also come across a lot of like font issues, like in where in like Unicode is. So we, the clients always prefer when it's come to like print, when they're gonna print the document or something, they prefer it in like FM fonts. We, like if it's in Singhala, it's Abaya or something, or if it's like Tamil, it's Bamini. So what is the issue is like, say that we have it in Unicode. So when you read it on a computer, you can read Unicode easily, but not Bamini. So there are issues like that. So how would you link these typography like translators? Like, do you see any link between those two? Or like, no. We used to have this phrase called "If it ain't broken, why fix it?" So that, I think that's probably the the mindset uh, of people who have been using the legacy encoding half. So if they if they're comfortable with PageMaker running on Windows ninety eight or ninety five and it's been working well for like 30 over years, why go change that, <laughs> all right? Um, and it's very hard to convince them uh, because it, it the process uh, of change uh, is very tedious, you know? They have to learn a new system altogether, a new way of, uh, the, the, whole, the entire workflow changes. So they don't want to go through that. Um, uh, the, the issue is not, I don't think the issue has anything to do with design. Um, they may hate those fonts for, for all I know, but they don't have a choice. I mean, they don't want uh, to go through, they don't want to pay the price of change 
um, yeah, that, or the benefits are not uh, valuable enough for them to do the switch. Um, perhaps, you know, if we have all these problems solved and you have like really fantastic looking uh, tie faces coming into the market and then you say, hey, I want those things, then you have to switch, right? Um, until then, it, it's very difficult to convince them uh, uh, to change. Um, it's, I think it's more economical reason um, than design reasons. Uh, I don't think the time to change is, uh, I mean, the time to change is drawing near. Um, we have the same issue in Malaysia too. I mean, people still use PageMaker to do magazines. Right? But when they get articles from contributors and they all come in Unicode and say, hey, what do I do with this, right? Of course, they have converters, but how long are they going to do that? So that actually increases um, uh, their workflow process. So when they, when they hit into this problem, that's when it changes. Um, and I'll, I have another uh, story that I can share with those who are finding it difficult to sell, <laughs> uh, uh, especially when users ask for free or for a cup of coffee. <laughs> I used to give them this triangle, right? Uh, it's got three apexes, so it's got fast, it's got cheap, and it's got uh, good, right? You can only have two of those. If you want to have fast and good, it won't be cheap. <laughs> if you want to have good and cheap, it won't be fast, <laughs> right? You can only have two of them. You can, you can explain that story to them. So that's the reason why they don't want to change, you know? <laughs> they want all three together. Right? You give me something that is fast, that is good, that is cheap, then I will change, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so we are running out of time and we are going to uh, close the, the session. I'll just, uh, uh, you, we can have these uh, conversations and the, the good thing is we have a platform that can ha we can have these uh, conversations, especially if you think about the, the Unicode and non-Unicode issue, it's just uh, something that uh, all of the, the, everybody that works in, in fonts and, and uh, typographic and text technologies have, like, no, it's, it's a, an issue. And uh, for at least Sri Lanka, we have built a, a platform, uh, like, everybody together to sort of discuss these things and uh, with the, 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 the university and uh, University of Morotu and also uh, the lot of uh, the other community coming together and the Akuru Collective. So what we are sort of uh, thinking of going forward from uh, this uh, point is to sort of discuss this as a common shared issues and sort of trying to try to solve this because the, the, the issue you have as a translator is the, the same issue is affecting the, the, the publishing industry and also the advertising industry uh, where there's not enough Unicode fonts. And even if we do uh, Unicode fonts, we have been producing Unicode fonts, but uh, these are not being used and cannot be used in, in certain cases. And I think the, the times are changing because at least uh, from my personal experience, I've seen the queries and complaints about this is increasing. You know, the, the, yeah. So I think it's a good sign. You know, uh, and and uh, especially as a translator, I think it's a it's a it's a it's a hell, it's hell to actually work with these things because you translate the text and if you, if you encode it in like again ASCII, there's no difference between the the texts. Uh, so yeah, uh, to to wrap up the session, we have some uh, like we have a video from the, our last event. We'll just uh, take a look at uh, that. <coughs>
never thought that uh, simple tools like a popsicle stick can be used uh, to do calligraphy. The tradition of Ola leaf writing has played an integral part in our written tradition of Sri Lanka and uh, it's clearly a dying art and uh, I thought that it would be wonderful just to go deep into this and see uh, what this is all about.